Hello again. I'm not doing this sermon as well, I promise. That would be too much. That would be too much for you. I do have the great privilege, though, of introducing a very dear friend of mine, a friend of Bill, a friend of our church denomination, and just a, guy, a, manly, a manly guy. I didn't mean to say that word, but he is pretty manly, actually. A godly man. Pastor Wayne Spriggs is the district superintendent for the district that we belong to in the CMA. And that means that he is uh, in charge of over 100 churches in what we call the Central Pacific District. It's California and a few other states involved. It's a real privilege for us to have him here. He's going to open up the word of God with us. Are you excited? Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, put your hands together right now and let's welcome Pastor Wayne to the stage. Thank you, friend. Well, good morning. What a delight to be with you this morning and to really experience the presence of God as we were worshiping uh, a few minutes ago. And thank you, Tim. Uh, Tim serves on something we call our district executive committee. You don't have to memorize that, uh, but I really thank God for his service. And Pastor Bill uh, has been serving on our nominating committee as a district, and we really thank the Lord uh, for his uh, partnership I I really do consider him a friend, and uh, Tim as well. And uh, I want to thank you as a church for the way in which you engage uh, with the Christian Missionary Alliance and with the Central Pacific District as we are engaged in ministry all across our great region. And God is at work, and I don't have time to tell you the stories, but if you would like to come in May... We are having what we call our our Encounter District Conference here at Pathway between May 2nd and May 4th. And two nights, May 3rd and May 4th, there will be services here beginning at 7 o'clock each night. And we would love you to come. You would learn more about what God is doing in the family that you're part of. Uh, I'll be speaking on the first night, the Tuesday night, and then on Wednesday night, the Vice President of Church Ministries, uh, Terry Smith, will be speaking. So you're welcome to come to those Uh, special services, and you'll learn a lot more about what God is doing through the uh, Christian Missionary Alliance and the district that you're a part of. Well, I really consider it a tremendous privilege to be with you this morning, and uh, I would like to ask that you would open your hearts to receive from God's Word, and that uh, you would just simply join me in a moment of prayer. Our God and our Father, we have worshipped you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord, for the declaration of your word as we saw it on the screen, as passages of scripture, your words were proclaimed. And then we sang your words and we declared your praise. And now, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive afresh from you this morning. Lord, Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. And we just pray that you would clearly speak to each one of us. Give us ears to hear. Uh, Lord, give us hearts that are filled with your love. And Lord, give us hands to do what you call us to do today. So we bless you, O God, and we praise you. And uh, we just pray, Spirit of the living God, that you just settle in amongst us right now and speak very clearly to us. And we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, a friend of mine's uh, uh, mother uh, recently uh, passed away. As a matter of fact, the funeral service was uh, held just two weeks ago today. And uh, on the following Monday, literally the day after, the family gathered together to hear the reading of uh, this lady's will. And I got to tell you something, I thought that only happened on TV. I didn't know it was really taking place. Uh, I've never been part of one of those kind of gatherings, so I just assumed it was uh, kind of a fictitious thing that occurred on television. But anyways, they really gathered uh, to hear this reading uh, of the will. And so this was this particular lady's last words. It it were, uh, as as, as, as we could understand it, her final marching orders. And frankly, from what I heard, she had some things to say in her will that kind of surprised her family. They weren't anticipating or expecting. Well, in contrast, the Bible tells us that Jesus gathered his 11 together uh, to a mountain that he had directed them toward. 
And there he also gave to them his last will and testament. Now, we call those words the Great Commission. And uh, the Great Commission actually contains one imperative and three participles. Now, I'm not going to bore you with an English grammar lesson this morning, so you can relax. But the three participles um, are actually a description of how we make disciples. You see, we make disciples as we are going, baptizing and teaching them obedience to the commands of Jesus. And I want to zero in just for a moment this morning on one of those participles. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, the key word there is the word baptizing. Now, this particular word is a variant of a Greek word called baptizio, and it actually appears about a hundred times in the New Testament. And the word literally means, this you might want to zero in for a moment, the word literally means to immerse or submerge. And in most Alliance churches, and I know this is true here at Pathway, when you baptize people who have become followers of Jesus Christ, you dunk them under the water, right? You kind of put them right down in there. They're submerged. They're immersed in, in, in the water. They, I, I was in one of our churches just a couple of weeks ago, and they baptized uh, two people that particular Sunday. And I want to tell you something. They were dripping wet when they walked out of the baptismal tank that particular morning. So, if you've come here to Pathway for any length of time, or even if you're just brand new, we often associate this word baptize with what I've just described, water baptism, where people kind of get all wet. And, and that's not surprising because we know in the New Testament that John baptized, Jesus was baptized, and the apostles baptized. So it's little wonder then that we associate the word with Duncan folks in, in water. But did you know, did you know that if you are a Christian this morning, that at the moment of your salvation, you were actually baptized into Christ Jesus? You, you were immersed in him. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 uh, puts it this way. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized, we were submerged, we were immersed into his death? So this morning, if you're here at Pathway and you have repented of your sins and welcomed Jesus Christ into your life, you've been immersed in Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Thank you. You've been immersed in Jesus, and that, you know what that means? Yep, you were dunked in Jesus. <laughs> you were dunked in Jesus. And, and so as you were dunked in Jesus, you were immersed, the Bible says, into his death. That's right. You were immersed into his death. We, we go on in uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, and, and we read there that we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was what? Raised from the dead to the glory or by the glory of the Father, what? We too might walk in newness of life. I was talking to someone between the two services, so I didn't say this in the first service. But as we were talking, I, I was just referring to my own faith story and how I had come to faith at 19 years of age. And the night that I knelt beside my bed and prayed to ask Christ to forgive me of my sins and come into my life, I had no idea that I got dunked that night. I mean, I had no idea. I just simply got into bed and fell asleep. I, had no, I didn't know that I was immersed that night into, the, in, into Jesus Christ and into, you know, his death and all this other cool stuff. That was some time later that I began to discover that. But I, I want to stop there just for a moment because what I'm emphasizing this morning is this, that if you are a Christian today, you, yes, you have been buried with Christ, 
by this baptism into his death, so that even as Christ was what? Raised from the dead, you could walk in newness of life. Without this truth, you could not walk in newness of life. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment this morning. Jesus Christ died on the cross. A couple of weeks from now, we're going to celebrate what we call Good Friday. It's the day we remember that Christ literally, physically died on the cross. And then he was literally buried. It was no illusion. It was no coincidence. It was no mistake. I'm telling you, the, the Bible is absolutely clear. Jesus was buried. He was dead, and he was buried. Now, I don't know what your experience is, but generally speaking, and I've been a pastor for a long time, I only bury people who are dead. I'm not known to burying people that are alive. Um, and yes, I presided over a lot of funeral services during, during my time. And yet, the scripture that we're reading here this morning reminds us that when we became followers of Jesus Christ, when we became Christians, we were buried with Christ. And why? Because we were baptized into Christ's death. And so if you're here this morning and you've never yet repented of your sins and received Jesus Christ into your life, well then, you've not yet been immersed or dunked in Jesus. But I've got great news for you this morning. You can today have Christ dwelling in your life. Yes, you can be dunked in Jesus today. And before the service concludes this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray a very simple prayer that will guarantee, absolutely assure that Jesus Christ will come into your life and he will dwell within you. And you may not know all the details, just like I didn't know all the details when I was 19 years of age, but you can experience new life through Jesus Christ even this morning. Well, the story is told of a Sunday many years ago in the South where the congregation walked into their regular morning service, their Sunday morning service, to be absolutely astounded because at the front of the church, beneath the pulpit, was a casket. And, and the people began to talk to one another and whisper. You know, they didn't do it very loud, but they began to whisper to, to one another, and they, and, and, and they said, well, what, what, what's going on? Like, like... You know, like, did you know that someone had died in our church? And, and, and you know, no one seemed to know that anyone had died. And, and, and then, well, if they did die, how come we weren't told? And, and why is there a funeral occurring during our Sunday morning service? Usually that wasn't the, the way things rolled in that particular church. Well, the hour of worship dawned, and the pastor appeared in the pulpit. And, why well, he carried on the service as if nothing you know, nothing had happened. Like, he made no reference to the casket was there. Like, he, he just seemed to ignore it. And then when he got up to then preach the sermon, he looked out at the congregation, and, and he said, I suppose you wonder why there's a casket in the front of our church today. And, and I suspect you're wondering who died, and, and why are we having a funeral here on Sunday morning as part of our regular service? And then the pastor left the pulpit. And he went down beside the casket. And he said, friends, I would like you to pay your respects to the dearly departed one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the casket. And I'm going to ask you to come out of your seats one at a time in procession. And I want you to pass in front of the casket. And I want to fulfill your, you to fulfill your Christian duty. Well, can you imagine? I mean, there was no sound in the congregation, but the quizzical looks on people's faces, why, why they said it all. And so finally, after a, a long pause, people began to stand up. And the first person made their way down the aisle, and they passed in front of the casket, and they looked down in, only to see a reflection of themselves. You see, the pastor had put a full-length mirror in the bottom of that casket. 
And as each person passed by to pay their respects, the reflection they saw was themselves. And so it is that the Apostle Paul declares to us, we have died with Christ. And he writes to the Galatians in chapter 2 and verse 20, and, and the words are there on the screen, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, what, what? Christ who lives in me. He was really crystal clear about that, wasn't he? And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. This morning, I have incredibly good news. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, friend, you have been crucified with Christ. That doesn't sound particularly nice, but it leads to life. Because, you see, it's no longer you who live. That is the old you. No, instead, it is Christ who lives in you. And, and here's what's so critical, Pathway Church. This life that you now live is not of your own doing. Did you catch that? It's not of your own doing. It is not by your means or your strength or your power. No, it is Christ in you, Paul tells the Colossians. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Christ is living in you this morning, and therefore he is doing the work. You see, you've been baptized. Yep, you've been dunked in Christ Jesus. And he is alive in you, absolutely alive in you. One of my favorite Sundays of the year is Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday because that Sunday we celebrate specifically Jesus is alive and he's not alive somewhere out there. No, he's alive in you. If you've received him into your life, he's alive right now in you. And what I've just shared with you, friends, whether we knew it or not before we came to this service today, is absolutely true. God said it in his word, therefore it's true. And, and here's the question I want to ask you. Are you trying to live the Christian life by your own power and strength, or are you living it by the life of Christ who is dwelling within you? I want to illustrate this this morning by taking us back to the what we call the Old Testament, to the story of one of the patriarchs, a man named Jacob. His name literally means supplanter or usurper, one who seizes or circumvents. How would you like to have that as a part of your name? I don't think I would. He was a deceiver. Jacob was. Some of you went to Sunday school years ago like I did. You might remember that he was a deceiver from birth, for goodness sakes. And the one he deceived the most, his brother Esau. Well, the book of Genesis tells, that, tells us that there was a time when the supplanter was to meet his brother again. I mean, they had been apart for a long time. And in time, they were going to reconnect. And Genesis uh, chapter 32 uh, records for us that Jacob acted in that moment just like his name. I mean, he did everything humanly possible to appease, to bribe, to gain the favor of Esau. The Bible tells us that Esau was well prepared for this meeting with his brother, by the way. Uh, it's recorded in Scripture that he had 400 men with him. And we go on and we read in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 32, that Jacob goes back to conniving and conspiring. And so what does he do? He divides his people. He divides them into two camps because he figures that if Esau attacks and conquers the one camp, why the other camp will be able to escape. And then what appears in Scripture as a kind of afterthought, he prays to the God of his father Abraham and Isaac. And this, as you'll see on the screen, is his prayer. Please, please, he's pleading with God. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. 
But do you know that a mere breath later, just a moment, why the circumventor is back to his old tricks again. And you want to say, Jacob, is it prayer or is it tricks? For the Bible tells us he sends a gift along to Esau. Verse 20 is as blunt as blunt could possibly be. For he thought. Have you ever done that? You think you're going to do the right thing? For he thought. Boy, if we had our Bibles all open right now, I'd have us underline that because I think that's so significant. It's how we often operate. I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. May I ask you, have you ever been there? Have you ever done that? I know I have. And then the Bible goes on and tells us that at nightfall, Jacob sends his family ahead. And we read in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 24 that Jacob was left alone. Have you ever been left alone? Left to your own devices, left to your own plans and programs and whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Oh, Jacob was left alone. And the Bible says, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day, conniving, circumventing, appeasing. Who was there to wrestle with Jacob? None other than the second person of the Trinity, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the midst of a wrestling match that frankly makes Friday night wrestling look like child's play, oh yeah, Friday night wrestling is play acting, isn't it? This, this, my friends, was no act. And Jesus, the Bible tells us, touched the hip socket of Jacob, and Jacob was broken, and he would not let go until Jesus would bless him. And in that moment, the Bible tells us that Jesus changed Jacob's name. You see, Jacob was baptized. He was immersed into Jesus, and now it could be said of Jacob, it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Verse 31 really nails it. For Genesis 32 tells us, at verse 31, the sun rose upon him, that's Jacob, as he passed Penuel, limping because of the hip. The next morning, Jacob got up to go and check on his flocks. Ooh! His hip hurt. He got out amongst the flocks, and as he was turning just to the right, ooh, that hip hurt. It was pain. It was real pain. He came home to have lunch with his family, and as he sat on his mat, ooh, there was pain again. Off he went into the fields in the middle of the afternoon, and yes, oh, there was pain again in that night. He came to lie upon his mat, and as he was lowering himself onto his mat, again, ooh, that pain, it hurt. Now, here's the biblical truth for you this morning. If you're a Christian, if you have repented of your sins and received Jesus Christ into your life, your hip has been bruised by Jesus. You see, you're now limping because it's no longer you who are alive, but it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is Christ who is alive in you. You're, you're, you're dead in Christ. But he, Jesus, is most alive. That's true. That's reality. And yet you say, but Pastor Wayne, how can this be true? D -d -d what about the stuff that happened in my life just this past week? I mean, my so-called walk, my, my so-called newness of life, why, it was kind of deficient. So Jacob's name gets changed from supplanter to Israel, which means God strives. 
That's right, God does the work, not us. And here's the deal. Jacob goes forth from his all-star wrestling night with a new name. And yet, sometimes when we meet him again in Scripture, he's still Jacob. Frankly, God has to reappear to him at uh, Padam Aram. We read about this in Genesis 35, 9, and there God renames him again. He gives Jacob a great promise. And again, yes, by verse 22, he's referred to as Israel. But in verse 27, a mere five verses later, good grief, he's called Jacob again. And if you go on to Genesis chapter 37, and again, those of you like me who had the privilege of going to Sunday school, you'll remember the story of Joseph and his coat of many colors. And there, Jacob slash Israel is back to his old conniving again, treating one of his sons better than the others. My point, well, let me not make the point. I want to let the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 make the point. The passage that speaks of who you and I, who we are in, in Christ, who we are as Christians, having been baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, buried with him, walking in newness of life, the body of sin being brought to nothing, this same passage... This same text is going to tell us something very important because, you see, having been set free from sin, the life we live only to God, and yet, doggone it. I don't know if you're supposed to use that word in church, but anyways, doggone it. How come? How come two weeks ago I cut a driver off? Come on, give me a break. I'm supposed to be dead to sin, Alive to Christ, and yet two weeks ago, my old self didn't seem very crucified at that moment. What's the, what's the deal? Like, what's going on? Can, can any of you relate? I, I won't ask you to put up your hands. Well, can we go now to Romans 6 and verse 11? The Apostle Paul writes, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The New International Version of the Scriptures uses the word for consider count. The Old King James translation uses the word reckon. The original word comes from the world of accounting and bookkeeping. What we do Pathway friends, what we do is we simply recognize what is true. We acknowledge it. We affirm what is true. God said it. He did it. And we acknowledge it. We recognize it. Let me put it this way to you. Once a month, my wife and I take time to tally up and record our income and our expenses. We've been doing it for a long, long time. 36 years ago, approximately, a little, little less than that, but almost 36 years ago, I was a church planter. And I wasn't paid particularly well. Oh, my goodness. So a few years ago, my wife and I, we were hunting around our house for something. I don't know, I don't know why we were doing it. And we found the little book that we used to record our expenses and our income in. And we started to read it. We started laughing. One ice cream cone, not two ice cream cones, one ice cream cone, $1.25. And doggy treats. No, we were not so poor that we had to eat doggy treats. Those were for our German shepherd. But the point this morning is simply this. We had a small income, and we needed to count every penny to make it work. And here's what we were doing. You know what we were doing? We were simply acknowledging what was true. We couldn't add one dime to our income. I mean, it was the church that decided what I was going to be paid. And my wife was a uh, full-time mother and homemaker. She didn't have any income in those days. All we could do was reckon or count and keep our expenditures, you get this right, under, under our income. And you know today, our income is, it's a bit larger, maybe even significant larger than what 
we earned all those years ago. But you know something? We still do it once a month. We record our income and record our expenses. Oh, yes, we do use an Excel spreadsheet today. I haven't moved on to those apps that allow you to do that stuff. But we still do it because it keeps us accountable. Oh, friends, my point is simply this. What Paul is saying to us through Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 is this. Count yourself. Recognize, acknowledge what is already true. And if you know Jesus is your Savior this morning, if you've been crucified with Christ, it is no longer you who lives. It is Christ who is alive in you. And sure, the self and Satan can delightfully, well, well, not so delightfully, deceive us into believing it ain't so. But tell me it ain't so. Because it ain't so. Because God's word says don't believe it. Instead, consider or count yourself as you really are. Dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's the challenge to you this morning. Are you living this way? Are you living as you really are? Dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. One very quick final illustration. Comes to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where we're told not to get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So last week we had at the Central Pacific District office our licensing, ordination, and consecration council. Only in the Christian Mission Alliance could we come up with a long name like that. But anyways... One of the candidates told us that he has to pray every day to be filled with the Spirit. Will you allow me this morning to tell you that that's not the intention of Ephesians 5.18? Because the text in Ephesians 5.18 in the original language carries the implication of go on being filled. Or keep on being filled. And the one who does the filling is the one who's already in you, Jesus Christ. He keeps filling you moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, because Christ is where? He's already dwelling in you. If you know him, he's in you. He's dwelling in you, friend. And so the scriptures encourage us simply count, reckon, consider, identify yourself as you really are, alive to Christ. And when you do that, guess who does the work? Jesus does the work. You don't do it. He does it. I suppose if you feel that you'd like to, there's no harm in daily asking to be filled with the Spirit. I don't think there's any, anything that's harmful about doing that. But you don't need to. You don't need to. Because Christ is in you. So recognize, acknowledge, count yourself to what is really true. You are alive, alone in Jesus Christ. And he will keep on, keeping on, keeping on doing what only he can do. And that is transform, fill, and empower you to walk in newness of life. Well, as we draw to a close in a moment, and we're going to pray... I want to speak, first of all, to those of you who are here this morning. And when you say in Scripture that Christ is living within, you might be thinking, well, I'm not sure Christ is living in me. And if you've not yet repented of your sins, that is, you've simply turned from them, and you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, he isn't yet dwelling within you. But when you do that, you invite him into your life, and he begins to live in you. I can't explain all of that to you because it's a mystery to a certain extent, but it's most assuredly true. And in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you've never done so, to pray that. And then as you leave today, there's a booklet called Welcome to the Family. We'd love you to take that. It's at the doors. Or you can come forward, and there's a team ready to pray, and booklets are also available there. And then if you're here, as many of you are, and you at some point in your life have prayed to receive Christ into your life. But maybe 
Maybe you're still trying to live the Christian life in your own strength and in your own power. Today, I want to lead you through a very brief prayer that you would identify yourself as you really are. That you would count yourself. You would consider yourself dead to sin and alive in Christ. And if you'll pray that with me in just a moment, I want to encourage you as you leave today, turn to someone near you and say, I simply prayed to identify myself as I really am, dead to sin and alive in Jesus Christ. It's not a very profound prayer. Maybe you've never done it before. But if you'll tell somebody, it will empower you to walk that out the rest of this week and into the weeks beyond. There is a truth in Scripture about declaring with our mouths that which is true in our hearts. And so turn to your spouse, turn to your friend, turn to someone and say, I just prayed that today. And it will further enable you to just continue to count yourself as you really are. So as we take just a quiet moment, would you just let the Spirit of God search your hearts and just speak to you? You know where you are. God knows where you are. And then I want to lead you to pray with me uh, in two prayers, either the prayer to experience or to receive Christ into your life or a prayer to identify yourself as you really are. So let's just take a quiet moment. Would you bow your heads And uh, if you're comfortable closing your eyes, let's just take a quiet moment and let God speak to us. And so, Spirit of the living God, just, just settle in amongst us now and speak to, to us about where we are and what we need to do. If you've never received Christ into your life, would you just pray under your breath this simple prayer? Dear God, I acknowledge, I admit that I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of those sins. I I turn from them. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, would you come into my life? And then if you're here this morning and you've prayed a prayer like that, Would you be open to pray this kind of prayer? Dear God, I want to identify myself as you see me, dead to sin and alive to Jesus Christ. Today, I want to consider myself as you have declared in your word. And I'm praying right now that that will be part of my reality that I will live in this place that I really am already dead to self, dead to sin, and alive to Jesus Christ. Oh God, would you just seal to people's hearts those prayers that they have prayed, and will you accomplish your purposes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.